So one of the biggest problems people don't realize they have on keto is a high uric acid level. So what does that mean? Why should you worry about it? Do you have it? Will it result in anything unfortunate? So what does a cup of coffee and a cup of tea have to do with uric acid? It could be your solution or it could be your problem. We'll get to that at the end. But the point is uric acid is actually a big deal. It's kind of rediscovered. It's a renaissance in uric acid, UA. It's a lab test and I want to tell you about it because a lot of people with keto and carnivore as well get very high levels of uric acid and some even lead, lead to situations like gout or even pseudo gout. That's another topic for another day. But uric acid is something that needs to be followed. But it's not everything. It's getting a lot of attention nowadays. I think part of it is oversimplified and part of it's useful. Let's talk. So I'm a coffee drinker. Maybe that's a good thing. But the problem with uric acid is, especially for people who are starting keto, keto, when you start producing ketones, your uric acid will skyrocket. And if you have already had a predisposition to high uric acid, it's going to rocket. It will then come back and be even lower than you've had before. But for that transition, into keto could be very uncomfortable unless you know it's coming. That's the first thing. The second thing is that what are the things that have to do with uric acid in humans? There's a whole evolutionary reason that we don't have an enzyme anymore called uricase that breaks down uric acid. We accumulate it and it was basically a seasonal thing. As we started eating, as the theory goes, as we started eating fruits, into the summer and into the fall to get ready for winter, our bodies transition to fat accumulation, just like bears. Think about bears exactly. But we no longer have that seasonality. So that's one thing. We don't, we don't need to put on fat. So we have elevated uric acid. It does signal, let's get on fat. But the question now is, if uric acid is one of the things that are responsible for this obesity epidemic, how do we get here? It's not just one thing. What made uric acid get so high? And one of the things, as we'll find out about, there's actually three reasons that come into this. But one is fructose, which is sweeteners and sugars. And you go, wait a minute, we're not going to be doing that. And so you think of high fructose corn syrup, or you even think of sucrose, which is more or less 50%, 55% fructose. And so there's that. The other is alcohol. And then the other is this thing called purines. And in fact, purines in getting into gout, which is that other topic, was considered the disease of the affluent, disease of the kinks. Purines are the breakdown products of RNA and DNA. It's like, what cell doesn't have RNA and DNA? But it's more concentrated in animal proteins than it is in uh, plant proteins. And this is one of those issues that the vegans and the vegetarians clearly have a leg up because they don't eat meats, which are the higher culprits, especially organ meats specifically, the liver, the kidney, the et cetera, et cetera. And even some seafoods like scallops, and you can send, depending on what list you look on, uh, sardines and so on. But that's a minor part. It is a part. So uric acid is a lab that I feel has to be followed for the purines, for the alcohol consumption, and for the fructose consumption. For the general public that is not carnivore or keto, which is really isn't this audience, it's all about fructose. It's all about the high fructose corn syrup. It's all about the processed food. It's all about the refined carbs. Got it done clearly. But for decades, I did UA and found it a useless lab. And the reason I found it a useless lab is because if you're doing fasting insulin, that's the story follow somebody's insulin, glucose and insulin, and there you go, the story. Right now, they're saying, well, UA is a thing that needs to be followed. I think it's helpful, but it's not the best thing to look at. We're going to go and look at the labs in a second, just so you can see some of the differences. So in my life, I actually ended up with pseudo gout. How did I get there? I don't have salt for the most part. I certainly don't have sweets for the most part. I am a liver lover. And so what I discovered in my own situation to get out of that was that it's not just organ meats, it's vitamin A. Vitamin A, I won't say toxicity, vitamin A is easy to have too much of. You can have too much of it over a short period of time, which makes it dangerous, which makes it toxic. If you stop having it, it will go away. 
But vitamin A is high in liver, high in beef liver, higher in calves liver, very high in polar bear liver, which nobody has, and other sources of liver. So that is an issue that directly affects uric acid. So you have to be worried about that. So one of the things that is a contributing fact, contributory factor that we can all look at and adjust immediately isn't so much having coffee or having tea. We'll get to that. It goes back to the omega-6, the omega-3 ratio. Because you find that if you have a one-to-one -one ratio, which is what we're all shooting for, because that's what we had about 100 years ago, or maybe a little more than that, that's a very healthy ratio. If you have that, you actually absorb or reabsorb from your kidneys far less uric acid. So it's not a problem. So the idea that Americans now have a 20 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3, they are pulling in this uric acid that if they changed just that ratio of omega-6, which is your vegetable oils, it's your corn oils, it's your processed oils, versus fish oil, it would change everything. So that's the second factor. These two things are not taken into account. It's your vitamin A as, hey, pay attention to where your vitamin A is coming from because it's not just from liver. Some people say, well, I don't have liver. It's not an issue. Oh yeah, what creams do you put on your face? I bet vitamin A is in there. What vitamin A is in your multiple vitamin? I bet vitamin A is in there, big time. And you look at some of the other things that it's supplemented in the foods you're having, should you have processed foods. So your pre-existing amount of vitamin A that you're taking that is kind of unnatural is too high. It's pushing uric acid elevate, uh, uh, elevations higher and higher. You need to have a level of five and a half or lower. If it gets as high as six, which is the average apparently level in the United States, it's now getting problematic. And did you know that if it gets as high as seven, you will have gout kind of without any doubt, and that's a very painful condition. So you need to pay attention to why your uric acid is as high as it is. It's not just gonna be about fructose. If you're carnivore or keto, that's clearly not gonna be an issue. But it will be an issue about purines. What kind of meats are you having? The organ meats, which I tend to love, the vitamin A and the purines. And then you look at what is the ratio of your omega-6 to your omega-3. I'm going to ask you this. What do you think coffee has to do with it? Is that a good thing? What do you think green tea has to do with it? Huge prejudice here. If you're a vegan or vegetarian, you're going to say, oh, of course, green tea. And if you're like most of us who have a love affair with coffee, you're going to say it's coffee. I'm going to show you in a second what that has to do with it, but I want to show you some labs first. Let's go inside. So here's basically what we're being taught, is that these are the factors that lead into you having higher uh, uric acid levels. It is fructose is supposed to be the new headline news. Fructose, wow, imagine that, fructose. Well, you've always been a consumer of fructose to the degree that you've had for the last 70 years. We all are in the same boat, by the way. So this isn't me versus you, it's all in the same boat. We had refined carbohydrates, they were sweetened, whatever, lots of sugar in our diet, and sucrose, which is sugar, is 55% fructose, more or less, and so you've been having your fructose all the way. And fructose specifically sets up the chain reaction that creates a higher increased production of uric acid. Hmm. Okay then, what are the other things? Alcohol was the other one. Those who drink alcohol, and I'm not talking about gout here, I'm just talking about uric acid. Very high levels of uric acid, of course, lead to gout, and gout was the disease of kings, right? They had the next thing, purines, which is organ meats, and they had alcohol, and maybe they had sugar. Hard to know about that one back then. It's but sugar has become the dominant focus, and they think this is the thing that's driving the doubling of gout worldwide, by the way, is the sugar and the fructose, the high fructose corn syrup that is through sodas. Um, but also, in terms of alcohol, beer is the biggest culprit because it both has a lot of breakdown products, a lot of purines in beer, in addition to the alcohol. Wine is basically a, 
I wouldn't say it's neutral, it's the least offending. And then hard spirits are right after beer. The other thing was purines. So what are purines? Purines are the breakdown products of RNA and DNA. And you go, well, wait a minute, every cell that ever lived has RNA and DNA. Correct. But certain foods are much more concentrated than others. So you have animal, all animal uh, meats are more concentrated than plants. That's black and white, and that is true. And so consequently, this is where vegans and vegetarians really shine because they can say, I don't know a vegan or a vegetarian that gets gout. And that's probably correct because they just is not that concentrated in high purine foods. That's animal and that's specifically organ meats. And now today we're talking about that primarily has to do with liver. It's not the only story though. I'm just giving you the review. Purines, fructose was the big headline news and alcohol. But there's two more things you really need to consider that I want to bring into this. We'll be elaborating on it in another presentation, but for the time being, vitamin A. So yeah, I just said purines from organ meats. Absolutely. And you can go kidney and so on and so forth, but it's primarily liver. So liver is extraordinarily high in vitamin A and copper as well, but that you have beef liver and three times more concentrated is calves liver. I think 50 times more concentrated is polar bear liver. So, and yet they're all very nutritious. It's the concentration. So to use the word that they're toxic right away? No, I covered that on a whole nother video about liver and it's using it in common sense. You have liver once a week. I'm a liver lover. I could have it every day of my life. There's a problem there because I could easily get way too much vitamin A, copper, and um, that would be something. So that's, we'll get to the labs in a second. The next is omega-3 to 6 ratio. Most Americans, North Americans, have far too little omega-3, and they have far too much omega-6. So the omega-6 is the vegetable oil. It's all the oil you get in all your processed foods. Potato chips, when you go to a restaurant, it's cooked in. All of that is way too much omega-6. So by not having enough omega-3, you end up reabsorbing through the kidneys uh, uric acid that you were trying to excrete. When you have higher, appropriately higher, the one-to-one -one ratio we've been trying to get back to that we had 100 years ago would actually not absorb nearly as much uric acid. So that's a way. Getting your, 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 um, uh, your omega-3 levels up would take care of that. Okay, now on to the labs. Okay, so these are some labs. And as I said before, you know, I used to do UA, uric acid, as part of the labs for probably a couple of decades. And I didn't value it that much. It really didn't offer me any additional information that was going to make me change a treatment plan for a particular patient. It just, so it's like, I cut it out and I did not include it into these all these big panels I've been doing it on people. I'm going to add it back in because I do think it does provide some value, but not the value that we've been told, but something else that I discovered, namely what I've already told you. So here is what we're looking at is myself and my wife Judy, and we're pretty interested, we're pretty comparable in many ways. We're about the same age and eat the, pretty much the same diet. But look at our uric acid. 6-0, which is actually the average for the United States, which is actually a bad number to have. It should be high fours would be a good number. And she's 2.4. So she's like a princess of perfect uh, uric acid. Okay. Hmm. I can learn from her and she can learn from me. So why is mine so much higher? One is I am a liver lover. At the time we took this, which was in, uh, within six months, that I probably had liver every day back for the previous two months, if not a couple of years. And um, I was getting my vitamin A. I certainly was getting my purines, right? So that was kind of stereotypically. It was an organ meat, purines, but it's a vitamin A and uh, that is driving a big driver of uric acid, well-documented. So we didn't pull that one out of the midair. And uh, the other thing is by having high enough omega three, as I mentioned, and low enough omega-6. Yeah, ideally, you want the one-to-one -one ratio. So I thought I'd go over this. I'm really high. And what else can I add into that? Perhaps I drink a little more alcohol than she does. She is a glass of wine Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe. I'm at least two glasses of wine and a little more than that. So there's that. Uh, what else do we have? Our to go up to our omega-3-6, which is right up here, we are pretty much neck and neck, pretty much the same numbers. So that is not an independent. We should be a little higher in omega-3, but we're pretty darn close. Um, the other difference between 
uh, us is that when you look at inflammatory markers, I'm really low, and she's really high, but I just told you she has a really good uric acid. And uric acid is considered a, a neuroprotectant, a neuro, it's an antioxidant, uh, real high is a problem, real low is a problem. And so here we, how do we explain this? Now we look a little further and we find she has at that particular time, very low vitamin D. I was kind of low average actually, so I wasn't any great shakes, but much lower here. And her homocysteine, so homocysteine for me is fine. For hers, it was uh, just about twice as high. We are the same mutations of homozygous for MTHFR, C677T, should you want to know. It's just a problem with our ability to methylate. So we take care of that. I'm more of, I'm focused, I, all, all my B vitamins, certainly I came from liver, right? I had plenty of B vitamins. I had plenty of vitamin A, plenty of B vitamins. So that took care of that. Um, I did take vitamin D, so that took care of that, but she didn't do that much. So there's the difference in terms of lining these things up. So what I got out of this is that there is a number of factors that are not about fructose or alcohol or purines specifically. They're about vitamin A. Primarily, I would say in this particular case, I can't speak to copper, copper which is from the liver, in terms of that, there just isn't enough research on that. So I would strongly say vitamin A is a big mover when we're talking about organ meats, we're talking about primarily liver, and there's the case, really high. I was having beef liver, not calves liver, thank goodness, and you have to back it off. So liver is good, but you just have to exercise some common sense. Once a week is good, a couple times a week is good, not every day, or a couple times a day like I was having pate and so on and so forth. Loved it. So there you go. Okay, so now for the answer to the question of what the heck was this cup of coffee all about out there on the dock anyway, relative to tea? Well, I'm going to give you an answer, but we're going to go into farther detail, much more detail in the next uh, presentation. That coffee, not so much the caffeine, coffee has some polyphenols in this that actually inhibits an enzyme that makes uric acid called xanthine oxidase. So there's a polyphenol in coffee. It's also in decaf. So it has nothing to do with caffeinated or decaffeinated. And it blocks to a high extent xanthine oxidase. So it should help bring it down. Thing is, I'm the big coffee drinker and Judy isn't. So we're saying, I'd really be high then, wouldn't I? Um, so clearly something for me to consider. Whereas tea, on the other hand, and you'll see the documentation for this as well, massive amount of documentation that tea does not help uric acid. All the vegetarians and vegans definitely want to say, oh, green tea, it's up for everything. No, it, it's not for everything. And there is no documentation that tea in general, be it black tea or green tea, um, helps at all with uric acid. Till next time. So if this is the kind of video that you like, that we go deeper into a smaller area that has a lot of relevance to a particular population, let me know. Because my way is going, what are the labs about? What's the research about? Let's be real. It's just not hypothetical. It's not like, oh, I've read 10 different abstracts and therefore this is the conclusion. I take that idea and let's look at the labs. Do the labs tell the story that we have just learned about in these particular studies? If they do, that's a home run. If not, then it's too esoteric. But let me know if this is something you're interested in. Thanks.